Well, I know why you're here. I know why you're here. You're here to connect with God. And the good news is that God wants to connect with you as well. No matter what kind of week you've had, some weeks are better than others, amen? No matter what kind of situation you find yourself in, the good news today that I can share with you is that you are not alone. Would you look at your neighbor and just say, you're not alone? I think every once in a while we just need to remind ourselves that there is a bigger picture that is going on around us. This isolation and all the things that we've walked through the last couple of years, <laughs> if we're not careful, can leave us with a settled sense of grumpiness. Amen? Now, I know that you're here to connect with God, and I pray that you don't just see me today, but that you see him. And I know that he wants to connect with you. But have you noticed that our culture is trying to interrupt that connection? Today, I want to talk to you about cancel culture. We've been going verse by verse through the book of Acts. And if you would, open your Bibles to Acts chapter 5. We're going to pick up in verse 17. And as you turn there, I want to ask you, has anyone ever tried to silence you? Has anyone ever tried to shut down your message? Perhaps there's been a physical ailment that has tried to keep you from being in the places and being with the people that you're to be with. This cancel culture is a part of what we see. And some of you in this room may have been the victim of cancel culture. I was joking yesterday. Somebody came up to me at the fall festival. By the way, wasn't that a great uh, fall festival yesterday? Our team did a great job. Thank you, you volunteered. <laughs> Somebody came up to me and said, Pastor, what are you dressed up as today? And I said, middle-aged white guy. They said, you nailed it. <laughs> it's hard to be a middle-aged white guy these days, especially if you're a Christian. There's a gentleman I met years ago named John Reimer. Some of you in this room know him. I first met John when I became the worship pastor at First Baptist Church in Hendersonville, North Carolina. He was also a longtime professor at Fruitland Baptist Bible College. So I knew him as a colleague at the Bible College, but he was also a member of the church where I was serving. And John was extremely well-respected in the congregation as a Bible teacher and as a man of God. And along the way, during my time in Hendersonville, about a year or so into my tenure there, somebody gave me a call and said, John Reimer would like for you to co-teach a Bible study with him, with men, on Friday mornings. And for me, that was one of the most sweet and intimidating invitations I've ever had. Because I knew of John before I even knew him because I had heard about him. Now, I want to tell you that John Reimer just recently passed away and I was reminded of the struggle that he went through because John, in the latter years of his life, became legally blind. And I'll never forget going to that Bible study. I think we were studying Galatians or one of the epistles and I had talked with him some. He had to have somebody drive him to the Bible study and we sat down and we began to teach and I just never had picked up on the fact that he had lost his sight until I got there. He walked in, and he opened the Bible, legally blind, and began to read the verses. John Reimer had memorized the entire book of the Bible that he was teaching from that day. John was not going to let anything, even the loss of his sight, interrupt what God had put on his heart. Now, he had every reason to stay home that day, he had every reason to step back from teaching and preaching and investing in younger pastors like myself. But John showed up that Friday morning and every Friday after that to teach and instruct. Nothing was going to cancel him. Nothing was going to stop him. And today we're going to focus on the things that may be trying to cancel the message that God has in your life. Cancel culture is a trend and it's not new. We're going to see it in Acts chapter 5. And with Christ, I want you to know that there is no such thing as being canceled. We have to get outside of our own plans, though, and outside of our own comfort zone, just like John. Bruce Frank, Frank the pastor of Biltmore Church up in the Asheville area, he said it this way, when, when a church loses its unity, it's because something became more important than Jesus and the Gospels. 
We have kids, youth, and adults all around us that need to know God through faith in Jesus Christ working in us. But I want to submit to you, church, that it's very hard to hear God's voice when you've already decided what you wanted to say. When we come to God and we ask him to bless the things that we've already decided on, I think he kind of grins and laughs and lets us define our measures of success. But I want to ask you today, are you so driven to succeed on the things that you've already decided God wants you to do before checking in with him that you're driving yourself crazy? You're wearing yourself out. You might be worn down today. You may have had a failure in your life because you're trying to lean into the things that, that God is not asking you to lean into. And maybe nobody sees it or maybe everybody can see it. But you're a hot mess inside. I want to tell you today that God sees you he loves you and he's here for you. And here's the bottom line today. In Christ, as Christians, church, you get this today. Even the weakest person in this room is strong. The Bible says, Paul said it, Christ said it, Peter put it on display. In our weakness, we are made strong through his power. But when we're weak, sometimes we get stuck. And if we get stuck long enough, in our weakness, what happens is we become what I will label as spiritually obese. This is what spiritual obesity looks like. It's when we are stuck for so long that we begin to spiritually become stuck. We've been still and stagnant for so long that forward motion seems foreign to us. And when things begin to move forward, we we step in and we say, that's not who we are and that's not what I'm about. And I want to tell you today what we're going to see in this passage in Acts chapter 5 is you can't cancel God's culture. You can do whatever you want to do, but for 2,000 years, nothing new under the sun, Solomon said, right? We've been trying to shut down this message for a long time and it's just not going to happen. You cannot cancel what God is doing. Now, what is cancel culture? Just a working definition Cancel culture, if you're not familiar with it, is the popular practice of withdrawing support or canceling a public figure or a company after they've done or said something that's considered objectionable or offensive. It's hard to be a Christian these days. Do you feel that? But that's nothing new. It's been hard to be a Christian since Acts chapter 5. Group shaming and Shutting things down is just part of life. And it's not just Christians that are dealing with it. How many of you have heard of this man, Dave Chappelle? Now, I'm just going to say Dave Chappelle is a comedian. He's edgy and I'm not endorsing his messages. Uh, he is a man who doesn't really chase down Christian narratives. Amen? But even him, he's been attacked recently by the LGBTQ community because of some things that he said, and he's in some struggling conversations with Netflix because of what he's done. And the LGBT community, he says, doesn't want to be silenced. So what they're doing is they're telling him that he can't speak. This was his statement. I'll read portions of it. And again, this is just another example of cancel culture today. He said, it's been said in the press that I was invited to speak with the transgender employees at Netflix and I refused. Well, that's not true. If they had invited me, I would have accepted, although I am confused about what we're speaking about. I said what I said, and boy, I heard what you said. How could I not? You said you wanted a safe working environment at Netflix. Well, it seems like now I'm the only one who can't go to the office anymore. Cancel culture is a real deal. And imagine dealing with cancel culture today in a situation like Dave Chappelle finds himself when we don't have the hope of Jesus behind us, the power of Jesus. See, there are some things in this world that will keep growing even if they die. That's the message of John 3.16. Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God is around us and he's involved in every situation and there is more to life than what we see. There is a spiritual realm that is wrestling with the message that we are carrying and it cannot overpower us. Amen? This is what it looks like to be born again. There is an old 
shell of who we were that lingers around, but it is dying, it is fading away, and there's a new creation that's coming out. Christ is doing this in our church. You are not who you used to be. And if we don't get this, we'll miss God's grand design for us. It'll pass right by while we're trying to live the life that we're not designed to live. And in Acts chapter 5, this is the power in our text, it says this, if this plan or this undertaking, just put this in your own life for a minute, is of man, it will what? Fail. If it's of man, it will fail. We have our plans, the Bible says, we make our plans, but God is the one that arranges what really happens in our life when it comes to our spiritual journey. And then we wonder why sometimes, when we go down our path, why God won't just bless our mess. Now today I want to look at a large chunk of scripture and read it with you, and I'm going to ask you just to stay seated, and let's talk through Acts chapter 5, verse 17, and let's see if we can pick up some of this cancel culture. Now, what has just happened in verse 16 is it says that there were people that were all healed. Everybody say healed. The sick were being tormented by unclean spirits. They were all healed. Everybody say healed. And there was a lot of commotion about what had just happened. And in verse 17 it says, But the high priest rose up and all who were with him that were uh, in the party of the Sadducees, they were filled with what, church? Jealousy. They arrested the apostles and they put them in the public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord came and opened the prison doors. They had locked these men up. The angel of the Lord comes, opens the doors, and brought them out and said to them, Go now and stand in the temple and speak to the people. All of the words of this capital L, life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak, and they began to teach. Now when the high priest came, and those who were with him, they called together the council, all of the senate, and all the people of Israel, and they sent to the prison to have them be brought. And But when the officers came, they did not find them in the prison. So they returned, and they reported these facts. We found the prison securely locked, and the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened these doors, we found no one inside. Now, when the captain of this temple and the chief priest heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them. Thank you. Wondering what this would come to. Now, let's just pause right there. You ever been in a situation where you're just sitting back like, I wonder what this is going to come to. We're going to sit back and watch this. Now, someone came and told them, look, the men whom you put in prison... This is what's going on. They're standing in the temple right now, and they're teaching the people. Then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were now afraid of being stoned by the people. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, Gentlemen, we strictly charged you not to what, church? Teach in this name. Notice they don't even say the name of Jesus here. They've already canceled it. We strictly charged you, don't teach in this name, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teachings. And you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Now the irony of this is that they have already done that to themselves. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God has now exalted at his right hand this Jesus as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they moved past jealousy. They were enraged and they wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, who was held in honor by all the people, somebody that was respected, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to the men of Israel, take care what you're about to do with these men. For before these days, he begins to reason with them, Thutis raised up, and claiming to be somebody, a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all those who follow him were dispersed, and nothing came of it. And after him, there's another guy named Judas, the Galilean, that rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people as well. 
Second example. And he perished too, he says. And all those who followed him were scattered. Cancel culture. So in the present case, this was his reasoning. Keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will what, church? Fail. Now just let's time out here by getting close. Did it fail? No, look around the room. We're still here. But if it's of God, you would not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. Huh. So they took his advice. Remember, two people just died instantly because they lied about giving. They took this guy's advice. They saw what was going on. And when they had called the apostles, they beat them. <laughs> no good deed goes unpunished in the kingdom of God. And they charged them, don't speak anymore in the name of this Jesus. And what does it say they did? They let them go. So then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing because they just got beat. <laughs> and they counted themselves worthy to suffer dishonor for the name of Jesus Christ. And every day in the temple, from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that Christ is Jesus. Now, I want to pray about this for a minute. I want to just pull out a few thoughts. Would you pray with me? Father, I pray that we would get some truth from this scripture, Lord. That we would realize why we're here more clearly, that we would feel your presence, and Lord, that we would have a great deal of strength walking out of this room knowing that there is nothing that can counsel what you're doing in our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody say together. Amen. All right. So let's look back at the Sadducees' reaction to God's power in this situation. Let's talk about that for a moment. First thing we see is they were filled with jealousy. Not many people talk about being jealous. They just are. Very rarely will someone come to you and say, I'm jealous of this or that or this person over here or what this hat this person has. They just take action on that jealousy and it comes out in different ways. Jealousy filled the Sanhedrin when the disciples and the apostles were healing people. That's the context. The Holy Spirit filled the believers. Satan had filled Ananias and Sapphira and they fell dead because of their lies about their giving. And the high priest now rises up taking official action as the leader of the Sanhedrin, and he comes in with jealousy. And they were also confused. They were greatly perplexed, the ESV says. What is going on here? Why are they in jail where we put them? It says that the angel of the Lord, sometimes the word angel just simply means messenger, someone let them out without them knowing, and now there's something going on that they need to shut down. But they were afraid to do it because they had gotten such a following. They were afraid to be stoned. The people that were against the Christian narrative, they were afraid that they would be stoned by the people. So they brought them in. And again, let's just park on this scripture again. If this plan, this may be something you need to hear today. If this plan is the undertaking of man. It will fail, even if it succeeds. And he gave two examples of it. Now the apostles' response, let's talk about that for a minute, to what happens when the Sadducees charged them not to speak. Well, first of all, they left rejoicing. There was something about being under the penalty of following Jesus Christ and his leading in their life that made them full of joy. They counted themselves worthy to suffer the way Christ had suffered, even though they were beaten. And when they were charged a second time, do not go and teach this anymore. Do not continue moving in this direction or else they did not cease. They did not stop. They did not get shut down. See, that the apostles knew that what they had to do and what they had to fuel what had to be done was coming directly from God. And they, they were so convinced that God was authoritative and powerful that there was nothing that could interrupt what he was going to do. Even if, even if they died for what they believed and what they did, which many of them did, even if they lost their life, the message was so important that they were going to usher it into a new generation. This is what it looks like in the scripture. We must obey God rather than men. But how do you know the difference? The disciples knew. They knew what they had to do. 
They didn't attempt to defend themselves. They were labeled civil disobedience. They just simply responded in obedience to the one that was leading them. And I want to say this to you. I think we need to be reminded of this. Like, this is nothing new. You will always meet resistance if you choose to meet with Jesus. If you make the decision to spend time with Jesus on a daily basis, and you listen to his still voice, and you follow him, you will always meet resistance when you choose to meet with Jesus. It's part of it. But church, we must obey God rather than men. Why? Because you can't shut God up. You cannot cancel his message. You cannot shut God off. You cannot cancel God. When the scripture says, we must obey God and not men, what you have to see in this, let me just see if I can get this across to you. This is not a matter of obedience, like we have to obey God rather than men. No, it's not about obedience, it's about opportunity. What the disciples saw in this moment was there was something so powerful that they, they, they had to follow that. It was the only option. It was like this, the return on the investment on this is so much better than anything else we can find on this world, in this world, and nothing can shut it down and nothing can cancel it. The cancel culture came down hard and fast on these disciples, and they saw that God was exalting himself through them and through Jesus, and they saw that Jesus was the supreme authority. It's the same thing today. You can't slow it down. If God's in it, in your life, you won't be able to stop it. And if God's not in it, there's nothing you can do to make it happen. Jesus is so strong and so faithful. Even when your life collapses, he doesn't. But you can't go alone. You always need friends. This past week, I finally got my car back from my last journey with Pastor Ryan and James on I-20. Took a week to get the thing fixed. But I'm back now. I'm in my car. I had temporary some little purple thing, go-kart that I drove. Susan Burgess offered to put some eyelashes on the front of this car that I was driving for a while. It's awful. It was awful. It's awful. But before I got the, the pink go-kart, my purple go-kart, one of my uh, friends here in the church, Joe Hurt, y'all got, you know him, he's one of my bald brothers, he plays bass up here, he's out of town this weekend, but he has a truck that he let me drive, and our team put a, this isn't a picture of his truck, but it's a truck kind of like that they put up, but Joe uh, let me drive his truck for a couple of days, so I got my, my rental purple bug looking thing, and anyway, I drove it for a couple of days, and Joe was gracious enough to drive me over to the rental car, rental car pickup uh, over to Enterprise. And on the way over there, they called me and said, it's going to be, Mr. Cutchins, about another 30 minutes before your car is ready. And um, just wanted you to know. And so I looked over at Joe, and I said, well, you can drop me off, and I'll just sit and wait. And he said, no, nah, let's go get some coffee. So we drove through coffee and got a drive through. And we were sitting there waiting for our coffee to be handed to us. And uh, I looked at Joe, and I said, Joe, I really appreciate you letting me drive your truck for a couple of days until we got all this thing squared out. And Joe looked at me. You know, if any of you know Joe, he's just a super humble, helpful guy. And he looked at me, and he said, this is exactly what he said. He said, and he motioned to me. He said, I'm glad we have this truck. <laughs> and I said, you mean you and your wife? He said, no, I'm glad we have this truck. He kept, like, saying it, like, this is our truck. Now, I didn't pay anything for this truck. But Joe, in that moment, was helping me. And he saw what he had as a tool that could be used to help somebody else. Joe was a friend of me. And there's a life lesson in this. You know, if you find that life has you on the side of the road, you know what you need to do? Call a friend. It's good to have friends, amen? And I want to tell you today that God is the best friend that you will ever have. 
So if you feel like you're being canceled by something, it may not be the culture. It may be other things. Lean into God and what he has for you. Stand strong in the midst of the resistance. Just keep moving forward. If someone throws a spear at you, don't pick up a spear and throw it back. Just pull it out. Let it bleed a little bit. Patch it up and keep moving. Keep doing the things that God has called you to do. And I want to encourage you today to oppose soft Christianity because it won't carry you through the hard times. One of the things I learned when my dad died was that my casual approach as a teenager, my casual approach to Christianity was not adequate. It had not prepared me for the hard things that I was going to do within life. So lean into the real Christianity, the Christianity that the disciples had when they got beat down and told to shut up and don't speak about this anymore. And they, they did it anyway. Because God called them to do it. And I want to encourage you to pray. Prayer is this, the power of the Christian journey. Amen? Tony Evans says it this way. He says, it always seems impossible until you pray. The reason prayer is so powerful is because it's it's kind of like that conversation I had with Joe. It's like talking to a friend. How many of you know that old hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus? All our sins and griefs to share. You bit it up. <laughs> what a privilege to carry. What is the next word? Everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. Why? All because we don't carry everything to God in prayer. Some of you need to make a call this week. And it's not to somebody in this room. You need to talk to God. You let him work out what's not working out. And submit to what he's calling you to do. There is no better place to be than inside of God's will. And there is no worse hell than trying to live outside of it. The scripture says that it's God's good and perfect will that all men come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And that doesn't mean that everyone will. It just means that the most perfect expression of God's love for this group of people that his son died for is that we would come to faith in him. And if we have it, that we're operating outside of what he has that's best for us. And that message of goodness that God so loved the world that our entire ministry led us to sing God so loved the world that he sent his son. That cannot be shut down and it cannot be slowed down. You cannot muzzle the creator of the universe. So be encouraged today that if you're chasing God, you don't have to be fearful of anything. He wants you to know that he's with you. I know why you're here. You're here because you want to connect with God. And the good news is he wants to connect with you as well. Why don't we sing a little bit of that song? Why don't you stand with me? What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to What a privilege to Everything to God. What we see of it someone here that's struggling with your message of goodness. Father, we thank you that your son died on the cross for us to have new life. Not old life, but new life. 
of whoever that is that's struggling with you today. Lord, I pray that today would be the day of salvation for them. Father, I pray that you would return our church to a heart of worship. That any disunity that is inside of us or around us, Lord, that we would submit that to the greater message and the greater purpose for which we exist, which is to be the hands and feet of your son, Jesus. Father, if there's anyone here today who has not placed their faith in you or needs to do business with you, as we sing this next song, Lord, I pray that this would be a time of renewing our hearts and allowing you to work in us and out of us whatever needs to be worked out. Father, I thank you for this church, Lord, and as we sing together, Lord, I pray that we would be brought together, not around agendas or around personalities, but around the purpose for which we exist. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Everyone said together.